All right. So welcome to the first video. Uh, this is going to be the history, of, a brief history of risk management and insurance. I'd like you to, when I step off screen, pause it, copy down these notes and make sure you bring them to London with you. Uh, it might be helpful at various stages while we're over there to refer to these. So copy them, uh, pause the video, copy it down, and then start playing again. All right, so this course concerns itself with risk management and insurance. And I'll briefly define both of these and give a very brief history and incomplete history as well, okay? All right, so first off, risk management. Um, humans have been doing risk management since the get-go. Otherwise, um, natural selection probably would have taken care of us, right? We, we don't jump over very dangerous distances in case we fall and break a leg. Uh, we, we don't go into the bear's den looking for some honeycomb, right? We, we manage our risk. So risk management in general is seeking to prevent or minimize harm and loss. We do it every day in our daily lives. We look both ways before we cross the street. Companies and corporations do it on a much different scale every day as well, right? And one of the careers we'll be talking about is what it means to be a risk manager for a company. All right, insurance then is one form of risk management. There's many other forms of risk management. Insurance is one of them. And insurance is a product you purchase that provides financial compensation for a harm and a loss if it, has, if it occurs, right? So insurance is one way of managing your risk. You're managing your risk of financial loss by purchasing insurance, which will compensate you for any financial loss in the event of a loss or in the event, yeah, in the event of an accident or a covered incident. All right, so historical examples, you know, I'm, I'm selectively picking these, uh, there's, there's hundreds of them. Uh, China, pre-industrial China. So we're looking 600 BCE to 1600 common era. Um, China, as in most areas of the world prior to uh, the internal combustion engine, rivers were trade routes. And so in China, um, one merchant would always distribute their goods that they were trying to ship over multiple boats before sending them over a rapids area in the river, all right? So if one boat went down, the merchant doesn't lose all their goods. Babylonia had this idea of bottom read, and it was actually in the Code of Hammurabi, so one of the first written legal documents we've ever found evidence of, and bottom read was listed in it. What bottom read meant is if, if you borrowed money to, to, to outfit a ship to go on a trading route or a trading run, if that ship goes down, you were given some compensation or some relief from the loan that you would have to repay, right? This was meant to encourage trade, and indeed it did. Uh, Rhodes, so you probably heard of one of the ancient wonders of the world was the Colossus of Rhodes. Uh, Rhodes was a shipping trading power in its day, and they had this idea of the general average. So if you had a, a vessel, a trading vessel, a ship, and it had maybe 30 different merchants put their goods in the ship to, to send it to Rome or to Athens to do some trading, every merchant would be charged a general average. And that general average would pay out any one merchant whose goods were lost while shipping, okay? So because ships weren't very good back then, and so if the storm came up, they would seek to lighten the ship by tossing overboard the first few things they could. So whichever merchant's goods were stored on deck, those goods could get tossed into the sea to, to help the ship survive a storm. Um, and so the general average would then compensate that merchant for their lost goods, right? Okay. There's, so all of these forms here are kind of shipping, property insurance, we would call this, or property uh, risk management. There's also ideas of life insurance. So ancient Greece and Rome had these benevolent societies and a benevolent society would basically look after its members. So if you were a member of one of these benevolent societies, um, and let's just say you were the, the, the father in this household, if, if you were to die, the benevolent society would step in and help take care of your family, right? They would also pay to bury you, okay? Um, these benevolent societies gradually evolved into the medieval guilds that sort of dominated um, European commercial enterprises for, for several centuries. And if you think about it, those guilds 
then evolved into societies like the Society of Actuaries or the Casualty Actuarial Society, which regulates who's allowed to enter the actuarial profession. Okay, fire insurance was also a, a common thing. Um, it, it didn't pay for your goods that were lost. Uh, fire insurance was basically, you had a contract with a private fire brigade. And so you, you pay your money, you get some kind of badge that you place on your front doorway. And if there's a fire in your neighborhood, the private fire brigade comes around and starts looking to see where their badges are, and they will fight to protect your house from a fire um, if you've got the badge on it. If your house doesn't have the badge on it, that fire brigade will, will stand there and watch your house burn down. Okay. Um, in fact, there's a story. One of the um, the first triumvirate in Rome was between three individuals. This is after sort of the Republic fell. You had Julius Caesar, um, Crassus. And a guy named Pompey, another military leader named Pompey. Crassus was the, the, the most wealthy man in Rome at the time. And he got his money because he owned a fire brigade. And what this fire brigade would do is they'd, they'd race to a fire and they'd see a house that had purchased fire insurance with their brigade. And so the fire brigade would negotiate with that homeowner to purchase their house. Um, now, the house is going to soon be worth nothing because it's going to burn to the ground. So the homeowner would basically sell to Crassus's fire brigade for pennies on the dollar. Crassus had amassed an immense amount of real estate in Rome and great wealth. Okay. Um, London had private fire brigades. Uh, Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin actually ran a private fire brigade for a while. Um, in London, uh, we'll learn about it more. In 1666, there was the Great Fire of London. The, the city of London burned for days. Um, and after that Great Fire of London, you started to see municipalities or cities like London and Rome and such start moving away from private fire brigades to more, um, I guess, public fire brigades because a private fire brigade wasn't really interested in stopping fires. They're just interested in making sure their clients' houses didn't burn. The rest of the block could burn to the ground for all they cared. Um, and that caused problems because if you want to put out a fire, you need to put it out everywhere or it just keeps growing elsewhere. Okay. That brings us to Lloyd's. So Lloyd's of London started in 1686 as coffee shop in London. Um, lovely story about caffeine, coffee and tea, caffeine replacing beer in, in England and Europe and, and what kind of gains of productivity that led to. But anyway, that's a story for another day. So 1686, the coffee bean starts to arrive from the, the Far East and, and people start getting really pumped about it, literally. Um, Guy by the name of Lloyd's opens up a coffee shop. And for whatever reason, and we'll learn more about this when we attend, go to Lloyd's London, Lloyd's began to be a place where ship's captains would gather to exchange news on shipping routes to, to West Africa or to the, the Spice Islands of the Far East, how to get there, what the best route is. Okay? So Lloyd's became this clearinghouse of information for sea captains. Gradually, it also became a place where people would start to write insurance for these boats that are setting out on these trade routes, right? To write insurance means to sell someone an insurance policy, right? Uh, and so we'll use that term write and written a lot with selling an insurance policy to somebody. Um, so Lloyd's also became a place where people would hang out who wish to sell maritime insurance. So from that maritime insurance roots, Lloyd's had basically grown over the following 330 plus years to the, the, the monstrosity it is today. And as Professor Young mentioned, it's hard to imagine or find any risk that doesn't pass through Lloyd's in one way or another in the entire world, right? So it's a fascinating place. It's no longer a coffee shop. I'm sure it's got a coffee shop within it. Um, but we'll learn a lot more about Lloyd's in London when we get there. And Lloyd's is perhaps the spot and the, the location we can say this is where the modern insurance world was born. 